Hello, hello. Webinar is about to start. I'm going to let everybody start uh, connecting and logging in and adjusting their audio settings to make sure we're good to go. We're going to give it one minute and then we'll jump right in. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Hello, hello. Welcome to the webinar. I'm going to give it another 45 seconds or so to allow everybody that's connecting live to uh, get their audio settings set up and all that stuff. And we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, all right, we got a 20 to 30 seconds left for us to get started. So get ready, we're gonna hit record. Session will be recorded and we, it will be put in YouTube and in podcast format as well, so. Okay, all right, let's get started. So welcome everybody to this eight part webinar series slash podcast series called Influential Conversations for Accountants. This session is gonna be part two. And this is part of the Reframe uh, 2024 Conference in Fort Lauderdale hype up slash us even brainstorming and preparing some of the topics that we're gonna be discussing at the Fort Lauderdale Conference in October in, 20, in 2024. Now, who is this webinar podcast series for? It is for accounting professionals. CPAs, enroll agents, bookkeepers, QuickBooks Pro advisors, small business advisors, anyone that works within the world of, of, of accounting and small business consulting services that is tangential to financial uh, reports and that sort of thing. That's the target audience for this podcast webinar series. Also, people that are looking to significantly improve their firm communication strategy so they can have more influential conversations for their clients. And the word influential, the world persuasion, everything in between, it's gonna come into play in this, uh, in this particular episode. Also, the people that are looking to develop their team through richer and more meaningful conversations is also the target for this podcast and webinar series. And lastly, the folks that want to improve their personal communication skills to bring less anxiety to and from work in their personal lives. Now, what's the commitment and cost? Well, first of all, the webinars, the eight-part webinar series is 100% free. We're going to do eight monthly episodes. You're currently listening to episode two out of the eight. So the next one is going to be live on April 12th. It's pretty much the second Friday of every month at 12 p.m. Eastern until we have our conference, the Reframe 2024 conference in October. You can watch via Zoom, uh, where you can comment, ask questions, interact with the actual content that we're putting together, or you can watch or listen to the uh, podcast recording via YouTube uh, or in, in my personal podcast later on. We'll try to keep it between 30 minutes to 60 minutes. We will have a, a cutoff at 60 minutes. Today, we have my brother, Carlos Garcia, and we also have Kevin Boyle, which I'll let Carlos introduced because uh, Kevin Boyle is a colleague of Carlos in the exactly what to say certified world. With that being said, uh, Carlos, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Hector. And uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining our second part of our eight part conference uh, for before the, the conference, right? The conference before the conference, Reframe 2024. And, you know, we're going to talk a lot about communication, language, word. Uh, selection and uh, these are just some of the main things that we will cover in the eight part series you know how to level up your communication strategy how to communicate your value how to command price standards expectations so that you can work with the clients that you want to attract right and how to smoothly transition maybe clients you don't want to work with negotiating terms pricing scope you know being able to use magic words so that you can influence uh, those potential customers, customers, team members, and Im important people in your circle to to work in, in your favor. And uh, a lot of these things are going to be covered today as well. And I'm excited because today I get to introduce a friend of mine. His name is Kevin M. Boyle, and he's a speaker, coach, real estate expert, and a fellow certified guide of the Exactly What to Say methodology. Kevin and I met uh 
last year and there was an instant connection because we have some similar backgrounds actually we both studied doing improv comedy and I think we learned a whole lot from it um and so I think we also have um explored very similar journeys when it comes to the world of communication of leadership of sales of of navigating through the even our own self-talk you know how to get out of our own way because I think that's typically the first obstacle we have to overcome is how do we challenge maybe existing beliefs that could be preventing us from from getting the clients we want pricing the way that we want you know running our business the way that we want and so Kevin welcome hey man how are you good to see you guys thanks for having me yeah so we're gonna have a conversation and I know that you're familiar with what we'll talk about today but really would love to get your inputs and insights because I know you've got plenty to share and uh, today's inspiration comes from um, our mentor, uh, Phil M. Jones, who has written over 11 books. But this book is actually an audiobook. It can only be accessed via Audible. And what's really interesting about this is that it's basically a jam-packed, I think it's about a four-hour sales workshop that he did live on Broadway in New York. Crazy. And it was, it was just what an amazing experience that must have been. I mean, and also for him, a one man show for four hours right. doing this just off the top of his head. You know, Kevin, any quick things for you when you heard this, this podcast or this uh, audiobook? You know, man, I, it, this is one of those uh, transformative moments for me and, and hearing him go through this entire four hour presentation. And, you know, obviously with some you know, sidebars and kind of leading into different sections. And it wasn't until afterwards that I realized that he recorded it live. And that, I mean, honestly, that blew my mind, but it also showed, you know, both, you know, his mastery of the material, but also how casual you can be with this type of toolkit to be able to, for everyone to learn it. It's very accessible. And I mean, I don't know how many times I've listened to this on Audible, like way more than probably you should, but uh, this is, this is a game changer for me in terms of not only hearing some of his work, but also see, hearing him apply it with some of the folks that that are there uh, in the crowd live watching. Yeah, I, I really love how he not only did he have prepared material and a structure and a, and a pace where it was easy to digest, but being able to use in the moment situations by asking the crowd for examples and being able to respond and navigate through those examples to help drive the points that he's trying to teach and the concepts. And so uh, it's really interactive. So I want to talk about the word persuasion. So as you all read this word right in front of you, big old word, because, you know, our intention here is to help you change your words so that you can change your world. But I'm curious if you just type in the chat and you think about the word persuasion or to persuade what are some words that come to mind for you? What, is, what does that mean to you? Now, don't go to ChatGPT or Google to, to actually give us the actual definition. We really want to know what you know. And there's no wrong answer, right? The goal here, this conference is called Reframe, and this webinar podcast series is called Reframe for a Reason, is let's take a look at what we currently know, believe, or interpret, and then let's see if there's an opportunity to shift the perspective of what it, what the intention is and what different types of application could be. So I don't know if uh, Hector or Kevin, anything stands out in the chat for you that you'd like to call out? Actually, so I, I just saw one come through that said manipulate, but in parentheses in a good way. And it actually comes <laughs> back to one of the, the definitions that I've, I've heard influence. And this comes from Phil, but that it's manipulation with integrity, you know, with, with a genuine, empathetic uh, kind of foundation. So I, I really do like the idea of, you know, not straying away from the word manipulation, but understanding what that means when you, when you marry that with, you know, positive and genuine integrity. Right on. It's kind of interesting how our, our minds tend to go towards when we read a word, not all the time, right? Because some of us maybe uh, may have a different uh, way to think of things, but I know for me, there are moments when I see words like these that could be triggering, my mind immediately goes to the negative association to it. And so what we really want to do is to just kind of help you think about what the true meaning of the word means. And, and by the way, 
the word can go both directions. It can go positive or it can go negative. And that's what we really want to try to embellish here is that the definition of persuasion is the process of influencing someone's beliefs, attitudes, intentions, motivations, or behaviors. What I like about this, thanks to our friend ChatGPT, they broke it down in such a way where it tells us that the method is that it involves using written or spoken communication to convey information, emotions, or reasoning. And it's written or spoken communication. So what we'll talk about is the with the how to persuade and get paid. It's not just about what exactly what you say, but it's all forms in the way you communicate your value, your business, your positioning. And there's so many elements in which you can persuade uh, a reader, an audience member, a potential customer, a team member, so on and so forth. And the goal is to change the audience's current perspective or behavior towards a more desired outcome. And what I'll add to this in the context of what we're talking about, it's about a mutually beneficial outcome where both the customer wins, you win, and their customers win too as a result of it. And the application is used in various contexts, but it can be done in advertising. Of course, you know this, right? We are in political season. Persuasion is, that's where I'm sure persuasion is where our minds tend to go when we think about uh, specific leaders or uh, when it's represented, could be represented the wrong way or in a manipulative way that creates a negative outcome. Um, and so their personal conversations uh, show up this way too. And, and then some techniques is appealing to the uh, emotions, presenting logical arguments, depending on the buyer styles, depending on personalities that you're working with and, and how people make decisions and what motivates others. But establishing credibility and using social proof is equally as important. And then of course, here's where the big asterisk we want to zoom in on is the ethical considerations. That is that what we're talking about here is ethical persuasion, right? It's to respect the audience's freedom of choice. And it's based on truthful and relevant information. Whereas where some of you may have thought of, you know, unethical persuasion is where we involve manipulation in the wrong form or even misinformation, which I know where we have uh, experienced a whole lot of that, especially in the world of news and the way we consume information in podcasts and YouTube videos on TV, so on, so forth. So I'll pause here, Kevin, anything you would add to or anything that stands out to you about this? I mean, I think, I think what you're trying to do here is not only like put yourself, I mean, this persuasion really is rooted in empathy, right? So you're needing to, like you say, that it's a mutually beneficial kind of uh, transaction uh, of sorts, but being able to say, okay, like what is, what is it that I'm trying to achieve here? You know, create that certainty for yourself. And then through that curiosity to be able to start working with the other person to create the certainty for them. And that's only when you can get into that moment of, okay, I see you and this is how I'm going to help you kind of guide into this direction and go into that ethical considerations. I mean, there's a lot of subconscious biases when it comes to persuasion and we can tell when someone is trying to manipulate us or trying to maybe pull one on us. And so really trying to make sure that you're coming across from a genuine place is going to be key because whether you know it or not, or whether they know it or not, they might not believe you or they might not trust you in that situation. Yeah. Such a great point there. And I want to kind of go in through a few misconceptions of what persuasion, you know, if your mind is going this way, you're not alone. But one of the, the first things that I hear when, when I talk about the word persuasion, at least to folks that I've coached in the past, or even a hump that I've had to get over is that persuasion is synonymous with selling. And then of course we use the word selling and then selling can also go a positive or a negative route but more often than not selling could feel like pushy pressure convincing manipulative right that you're trying to give something to someone that they don't need or they don't want and but the reality is is that persuasion is a key component of sales and it's used in the right context like in accounting or bookkeeping it's beyond selling it's about effectively communicating the value of your service and understanding clients need and building trust and one thing that, Kevin, you pointed out earlier, which I think is so key, is using empathy, right? It's like empathetic selling. It's like putting yourself in the shoes of the customer. And I, I think you know the definition of this, but Phil always references his what he his favorite definition of, of empathy. You remember what that one is? is? Is caring about what the people you care about care about. 
Can you say that again? It's slower. It's caring about the things that the people you care about care about. Talk about a, 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 a mouthful, right? It's like to care about what the people you care about care about. That's what empathy is. Well, Just I put think yourself. Yeah, go ahead. What I was going to say too, I mean, I think using like looking at where persuasion plays in with selling is really important too, because another thing that, you know, we we're going to echo a lot of what Phil says, but, you know, selling is, is, is gaining permission to help make a decision with someone. Persuasion is that first step of really getting into that place of being able to start to ask for per, per permission. And that comes from being able to get them to the same place, get them to that certainty of where you want them to be. Like, being able to gain that kind of information to put that in a position where it's like, okay, now, now that I know where you're at, based on the fact that you've said this, here are the things that I'd like to try to, to put you on. So I think that's it's seeing it as almost as a step into the direction of uh, that next step in selling. Yeah. And I see, I see a association from persuasion going into being able to use the customer's words yep. to show that you're actively listening and then as you've collected that information, that data, the, the reasons as to why they need what it is you're trying to present and being able to present it back in a way that connects with your solution. Another thing, again, something similar is that persuasion means aggressive or pushy, but effective persuasion is about influence and dialogue, not pressure. So it is possible to persuade through logical argumentation, clear explanation of benefits and responding to client leads or, or concerns. Just a couple of others that I'll go uh, go through here fairly quickly is that persuasion compromises professional integrity. That could be a, another misconception, right? I might seem unprofessional if I'm trying to persuade someone. That could be an internal logical thought or belief. And one way to challenge it is that it's, it's really all about being honest, transparent, and genuinely being invested in the customer's success it's about helping clients make informed decisions and not mislead them. And uh, another one is that technical expertise is enough and persuasion is unnecessary. I fall into this so much and I'm not sure, Kevin, if you found this, it's like people saying, you know, in the world of sales, it's like my work should already speak for itself. My work should sell itself. So why do I need to convince someone to work with me if I'm already an expert at what I do? And, and I don't know if you want to share any perspective on that. I mean, I think part of it is like we we think that being the smartest person in the room is what's going to move somebody into a position of being able to be influenced or persuaded. But really, ultimately, we need to be able to get them there with us. So we want to be able to ask the questions and back them up with our technical expertise and our experience and our background. But understanding where they're coming from first, you know, asking asking questions to move them into a place of sharing information that allows us to share about what we can do and how we can help them i think that's, that's it the key. that's it and people at the end of the day like to do business with people they like and know and trust and yes your work could speak for itself but at the end of the day they, they need to have a good feeling about working with you i don't know if you ever left the situation kevin maybe a, a major decision i know i have at least once in my life where i was about to make this major major huge decision and then my my friend calls me after whatever it is, right? Whether it's take that that job or take a customer or something. At the, at the end, it's like, what did you do? I didn't do it. And then why? And what's the typical response? It just didn't feel right. And it's always in that gut feeling, right? And so people need to feel like they can trust you, that they relate to you, that you understand the context or situation. So it's just the fact that you're the expert at what you do is not enough. And so our ability to persuade by being curious, asking questions, being thoughtful, connecting, helping your clients make them feel seen and heard is just as crucial as how great you are, what it is that you do and making that connection. Clients are best convinced with hard data and facts alone. Maybe some, but not all. I know, and uh, most of our decisions, research backs up that over 80% of decision-making comes from emotion first. It's a gut feeling. Logic tends to kind of go after the fact, right? And so I'm sure that many of you have been in a situation where, you know, you're, you're just, there's an impulse. Something connects to you and you're like, I got to get that thing. I mean, how many times have you ever gotten one of those like sponsored ads on Instagram because it follows what it is that you do? And like, for me, like I, I see this pair of shoes from Nike pop up at least like one once a week and every day I'm just like 
in inkling to like buy it, but it's all emotional. There's no logic behind it, right? Um, so I, I don't know if that, anything you, that you would add to that, uh, Kevin, around facts and and logic and emotion. I mean, I think I think it comes back to I mean, like the 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 options that people have out there are so numerous now, especially when it comes to online and virtual, you know, uh, options as well. So. Really, it comes back to how can you effectively persuade folks to work with you based off of like the understanding, like, look, I probably offer the exact same things that my uh, my competitors offers. The difference is how I approach not only my relationship with you, but my relationship with your business. And so I think that's that's when we get into, you know, it's yeah, everybody. I mean, a lot of people work with a lot of the same things, but they decide to go with option B instead of A because of that gut feeling, because of that relationship that they have or that first impression they have with somebody. Yeah, that's great. And you know, another misconception, we talked about that manipulation and unethical, and it's all about doing it ethically. It's about mutual benefit. It's about understanding and aligning, you know, your the client's needs with your services and, and make sure it aligns with your mission. And and so that's ultimately what we're here to to talk about and to to share with you. I think just just mm -hmm. just something to add there. I mean, I think part of your ability to persuade comes back to your confidence and your competence, you know, confidence in your competence. And so I think when you're starting to talk about how what you can do is to serve their company is that you, if you truly believe that, then it'll come across as genuine. But you have to really believe in the in the skills and the things that you're offering and not just, again, trying to get to here's a here's a sales moment or here's a, manip a manipulative moment. It's really, really believing in the foundation of what you do is what's going to come across as, you know, kind of that manipulation with integrity. That's it. And then I think the last one here we have is that to persuade is a natural talent. It's not a skill that can be developed. And that's actually the reality is that just it's a skill set that needs to be developed. The ability to persuade effectively can be honed in through practice, feedback, learning from successful models and some of those models that we'll teach today. But a lot of it is developing empathy, right? Listening skills and the ability to articulate value clearly. Kevin, one thing I really love that you say uh, in your keynote is that whenever you want to practice doing something to be at ready for the high stakes, it would be a good idea to maybe first do it in low stakes conversations. And you've got plenty of examples, but I, I'm curious if maybe you can share just one of those because I, I get thoroughly moved by some of the examples that you shared before. I mean, I think I think for me, it's, it's it, it all comes back to those instances where just showing some genuine connection and some empathy and curiosity with somebody can catch them, catch them into a, a place of, you know, vulnerability, which leads to trust. And, and that comes from being able to, have those moments where, you know, we talk about low stakes, low rewards, like it's, it's similar to being in batting cages or going to the range at a golf course. It's like, you know, practicing and hitting balls and, and, and that type of stuff. So that when you're ready to be, you know, in the game, you're able to do it, but it, it's just as simple of a conversation you have with a gas station attendant and they, you ask them how their day is going and they, they say something like awful. And you just say something like, what makes you say that? And then seven minutes later, you're in a conversation where there's no chance that you're ever going to walk into that that gas station again, and they're not going to recognize you or even know your name and you're going to know their name. And it's, it's, it's that moments of those, uh, of relationship building that leads into those persuasive actions of, you know, not that I'm going to ask for an extra Reese's peanut butter cup at the gas station, but at least I understand how to get to a place of genuine connection with folks so that, you know, it leaves them open to more negotiation and persuasion. Yeah. And I think that's such a great example is, you know, could you practice it in a place where there's there's nothing to risk, right? You're just practicing the skill set. And I love the batting cage, you know, real game uh, example there. So how do you ethically persuade and get paid? And so this is where we're going to go in a little bit deeper into some of the concepts that this audiobook goes into. And um, it's really around understanding sales being a process. It's learning how to stand out from your competitors. And so how do you persuade those potential customers that are looking at you as their business of choice to do their bookkeeping, tax, accounting work is to be more confident in your conversations so that you can attract the right customers, you can convey your value, and then communicating effectively so that you can improve negotiation skills. And that's another one of the words that could be interpreted as negotiation, right? Like, like the word persuasion, negotiation, 
influence. I don't know about you, but I know that it can feel like mm, negotiation makes me feel like I have to act like something or I have to force something. It's not about that. It's about how can you clearly communicate what the customer wants, what you can do for them and how there's mutual benefit so that you can arrive at a, a place of a mutual agreement where everybody benefits. And so there's nine levels of success that Phil breaks down. Of course, it's a four hour uh, audio book. We're, we're not going to be able to do that uh, in that time frame. So we're just going to give you some quick little points that I think uh, uh, connects to today's concept, which is about how to, how to persuade, uh, taking advantage of how to position yourself in a persuasive manner, how to build rapport and how that helps you through empathy, build a connection so that later on when you're making recommendations, you're earning that right to build authority and confidently be able to recommend solutions, how to identify and create genuine opportunities, how to give enough information to help the other person on the other side make a decision, how to gain that positive decision, because I'm sure you will get objections. You may still get uncertainty because some of these decisions could be difficult to make, like changing an existing accountant that you've worked with for, for 10 years and they've done it a certain way and you know going from doing it the manual way to using a new technology, like all these things can be scary. Establishing future opportunities. So how do you sustain uh, some of that business to, so that you could potentially do more with the customer? How do you schedule the next action? How do you, uh, when you're in the middle of a conversation that has you haven't fulfilled a need yet, how do you continue that relationship so that it turns into a business opportunity? how to ask for referrals, and then how to get referrals. And so we're going to start with positioning. And I know Hec I'm going to, we're going to loop in our positioning expert, Mr. Hector, but um, in, in a little bit, Hector's going to comment a little bit of what this is. But the, the, the most important question you want to ask is, who do you serve? So I'm curious, type in the text chat, and I want to see what you all have to say here when I ask you the question, who do you serve? So who is your target client? Let's see how... Um, how specific or vague you can be with it. Um, you know, we, we might have a few folks that might say anyone that has a heartbeat and a pulse. Uh, and then we may have others who might say something super, super specific. And we're going to talk a little about the difference between one and the other. Right. And so um, something that's important is to understand their demographics. Another aspect is their geographics. Where are they located? What kind of industry do you serve? Revenue size. This goes down to making sure that you select a niche. And there are a lot of risks when you are, when you generalize too much and you're casting too much of a wide net, um, you might you might find a lot of trash <laughs> and you may, may not find a lot of quality, right? I think there are a lot of risks to trying to be in everything for everyone. And another piece that, was interesting when it comes to understanding who do you serve is a psychographics. And so Hector, I know you're an expert at talking about this, but would you mind just sharing the, the piece of psychographics and what that could mean? Yeah. So um, the demographics is, you know, what the person looks on the outside, right? So that would be like age in some cases, race, that sort of thing. Geographics is where they're located or how, how the geography affects them. Psychographics is sort of like mindset or state of mind, you know, or basically uh, based on what they believe in, right? So you could segment clients based on what they believe in. Like, for example, like targeting vegans would be not, it's not a demographic, that would be a psychographic. So that's kind of the, the concept is, is you're, you're targeting people's beliefs. You're not trying to change them. You're not trying to um, agree or disagree. Uh, you're, you're trying to create a service around satisfying uh, or, or, or helping them make those beliefs come true or make those beliefs uh, become part of their lifestyle. And you, you can serve that. Yeah. And um, another piece that's important of knowing who do, you, uh, who do you serve is understand where they hang out. Because typically in those watering holes is where they get to talk a little bit about what their struggles are, what their concerns are, what they care about, right? This is where you can have better reference and context of what their true pain points are. And on the right side of the slide, you will see this beautiful picture of a missing poster. It's a kind of a silhouette of a person with a big question mark on it. 
And what what Phil shares with us in in this uh, segment is that build your own missing poster picture and and ask yourself these questions. Where does this person live? You know, is it, you know, what, what gender are they? What age range are they? What industry do they specialize in? Um, Where are they located? What is their frame of mind? Like what kind of business owners do I want to work with? Are they people who value the environment? Are they people who are technology forward? Are they uh, folks that are, that really value having a more in-depth one-to-one connection or do they want to treat treat me like a, a price shopper and and there's no wrong answer here you just need to know you know who your true target customer is so that you can have a clear understanding of how to message to them Kevin anything you would add uh, around positioning no, I think it's just it's just a matter, matter matter of being very specific I mean so specific about who you're trying to serve here so that you can uh you know you're not gonna you're not just qualifying or, or compromising on who you want to serve really really get um you know really get specific for who you want yep yeah. and we've got some great examples on the chat around some examples um in around positioning so a couple of examples of what bad position could look like i'm an accountant that helps any business owner with bookkeeping and tax work now i bet you're a bit like me if you got started like when I did, my first positioning statement was something to the effect of, and I'm not, I'm not an accountant, but I was a sales coach. And I was like, I do sales training for people, <laughs> like just anyone who needs training of any sort. And what I found myself is, was I was getting all these kind of leads from all over the place. And like somewhere just in place in industries that I was very unfamiliar with. And I found myself working really, really hard and I had to learn on the customer's dime. And it was just, it wasn't, it was a bad time. Um, when I started learning about the importance of positioning and started narrowing down my niche, I noticed that it wasn't as scary because my biggest fear, and I'm sure for some of you who haven't really thought about locking down your niche, um, you may feel scared of, well, but then I'll lose the opportunity to get anything or anyone, right? I may get less leads. But it's kind of contradictory. What ends up happening is that if you are much easier to be found, if you think about wanting to search for the best pizza spot in a specific location, how are you going to type it in Google? You're not going to say the best, the best food in the world. You're going to say the best pizza in Valencia, Spain, right? And, the, and that's the way clients are going to search you for you as well. They're going to say, who is the best tax advisor for manufacturing business in Miami, Florida. And so you have to make sure that you're messaging your positioning the way it shows up in your website, on your LinkedIn, on you know your omnipresent digital channels uh, is, is huge. And so um, what, what does it mean is if the, the more vague you go, what you're basically communicating is that I'm an everything for everyone. Here's a little bit of a better positioning. I'm an accounting consultant that works with construction business owners looking to increase profitability by having access to real-time financial information. Now, it could be a mouthful, but if someone's listening to this or reading this, they might probably be saying, hey, that's me. Yeah, this person gets me. They understand my pain points. Um, I'm, I'm a construction business owner. And maybe someone who's not in construction might say, I like the second part. So you're not you're not necessarily uh, uh, shying away the the non-construction business owners. What ends up kind of happening is that people say, "Do you also take care of blank industry?" And it might start a conversation for you. I know it's happened to me as well. So what does this essentially say? Is I provide many services for a specific group of businesses. Now there are. A bunch of different ways that you can improve your positioning. This is one of them. Another way you could say it is that I provide a very specific type of service for many businesses. Hector, do you want to share anything uh, on this and maybe some examples? Yeah, this is just a difference between having a vertical specialization versus horizontal specialization. So I provide many services for a specific group of businesses. Is Let's say I only work with uh, my, uh, family owned small manufacturers and, uh, but I do everything for them. I do bookkeeping. I do QuickBooks setup. I do financial planning. I do tax returns. Whereas with the second one is a horizontal specialization 
where I don't care who the business is. What, what, what I do is I reconcile equity accounts for partnerships, you know, like a very specific thing, right? So you can have a partnership that does manufacturing or real estate or a, 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 a restaurant. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, what these partners, uh, partnerships need is a, is a third party to come in there and reconcile all these distributions and contributions that they want to know exactly how much uh, equity does each partner have in the business because their books are a mess. So you you pick either one thing that you're really good at and you don't care who you do it for, or you do many things for a very specific uh, group of people because even though it's harder to do many things, when you do them for the same group of people, you start picking up on patterns and those patterns intertwine with the cross of the services. The idea here is to, to, to tell people that many other people you say no to. And for, so for the clients that you say yes to, that yes is a lot more powerful. It's a lot more significant. And it also makes people feel that hiring you is being part of the club, the club of the very specific type of client that you serve. Which, which elevates the value in which you can ser- provide those services, right? And one of the best positioning is providing a spe- very specific type of service for a very specific group of people. And one example is we design living trusts and per- per- perpetual tax planning for professionals, young part, uh, professional young parents looking for a structured financial plan for their lives and legacy. And so Hector, would you want to expand on any of this? No, I, I think uh, I think the, the the point is when you have this type of positioning, if a client comes to you and they're not a young parent, they're not your client, right? Um, if they're gonna be a young parent in the future, you can tell them, hey, you know, we wait at least until the kid is born, for whatever reason, right? Because the kid has a social security number, because I can actually put them on the trust, et cetera, et cetera. So you so you basically make people wait until the time is right, uh, and also, you know, if if they're not parents, say, look, I'm sorry, you know. It, unless you can make a case to what legacy means without kids, it's difficult for us to put a plan together because the living trust is mostly focused around this. And the type of tax planning that we do includes uh, the college, the the buying them a house, the buying them a car, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's okay to have a lot of people that they're, they're going to they're gonna tell you no. And it's okay to be very specific because again, the more specific you are, the more you can charge for that service. I'll give you a quick example. Um, my sliding door, okay? I, I know every single person here has ha- has a sliding door in their house or has had one that it just you know, makes noise or is very difficult to move around. You know, one a friend of mine came to the house and he saw me struggling with the sliding door. And he's like, you got to call Juan, my sliding door guy. I'm like, there's a sliding door guy. That's all he does. So Juan came in, he came in, he looked at it. He's like, yeah, I can fix it for you. It, it's going to be great. It'll be 150 bucks. I'm like, okay, when, when do you come back? He's like, no, no, I, I, I'll do it in the next 20 minutes. Okay. So I, I watched the guy work. He took the door out, had a little bag of a whole bunch of little wheels. He had like the, a wheel of every size, like a little wheel. And then he re, he repaired it. And then the sliding door was like, you know, like like uh, as smooth as butter moving on, on a heated pan. And then at that moment, I, I thought to myself, this is the best contractor I have ever worked with ever. The guy had all the stuff. He did it within 20 minutes. Yeah, he charged 150 bucks for 20 minutes, but then he was done. I was like, great. Now I, now I got a handyman. So I tell the guy, hey man, give me your number. There's a whole bunch of things I need you to do around the house. The guy's like, no, uh, sorry. I only do sliding doors. Uh, and I say, why? You're so good. He's like, that's why I'm so good. Because I only do sliding doors. So at that moment, um, you know, I saw you know, best possible position you can see. I saw it firsthand and I lived it. I experienced it. And I got to tell you something. I've had multiple contractors in my life. I have never recommended somebody so enthusiastic like my sliding door guy. Every time I get invited to a friend's house, I'm checking all the sliding doors to see if one starts squeaking just so I can have the opportunity to recommend Juan, my sliding door guy. So you stop getting invited to party sector. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you get raving fans, right? <laughs> So when your customers start checking other other uh, friends' uh, tax returns, they're gonna be like, "You got to talk to my my tax person." Um, but yes, so positioning: what problem do you solve? Identifying that need and gap, and helping you focusing on the outcomes and impacts 
not the inputs. And where you develop your unique value proposition is where you can be the most persuasive. So being able to be effective at knowing how to position yourself and make it simple. Use simple language. Don't use jargon or technical language that only you and your colleagues know. Use words that your customers are saying in their testimonials or when you ask them, what is it that I did that helped you solve your problem? Be able to use that in your positioning as well and having evidence of that success. So the second uh, aspect is, is building rapport. We talked about decisions being uh, predominantly based on emotions, not on logic. And so finish this sentence, if anybody wants to play this game, is people do business with people, they blank, blank, and blank. If some of you know that, go ahead and type it on the chat real quick. Let's see if you get the big price. The big price will be, Hector will share the number to the sliding door guy for everybody to get. And that's right, Stephanie. Hey, no like and trust. I think we've got some folks who, who've heard this uh, plenty of times before. And I may have said it earlier. And so that's what building rapport essentially is. You know, it's going back to that misconception is that we can't lean on just of our technical expertise, you know, go on the on the QuickBooks Pro Advisor site, putting our names in the directory and just expect that our business is just going to grow tenfold just because our name is on there on the website. There's more that we need to do to build that emotional connection with, with that audience. And that's just an example, one, one of many examples. And so rapport is not just built in conversation. It has to show up everywhere, on your business card, on your website, in the content that you create, social media, especially in the world of social media, people consume so much of it and their decisions are being influenced by the information that they get on social media. And if in their close network, you happen to be that sliding door person in the world of tax accounting, et cetera, then this is how you persuade them to choose you over the other tax bookkeeping accounting profession. I have to say, Liza, Liza took the words out of my mouth in the chat there by putting in reputation, right? I mean, I, when I hear rapport, I think of that as the external kind of uh, manifestation of your reputation, right? You think about maintaining rapport is the same way that you maintain reputation. It's consistent, right? Um, if Juan started recommending or Hector started recommending Juan to everybody and, and all of a sudden, like he gets three or four people back me, like, I mean, Juan came into my house and he had no wheels and he charged me $400 and he didn't fix it. You know, it's like, that's the same, that's that reputation, but also that rapport piece. So I think that's, that's a, a, a really good point that Liza makes there in the, in the chat. Yep, showing up everywhere and showing up consistently and, and backing up whatever claim you you are saying that that you are there to commit to in helping your customers. And what do you all think is the best tool to use in conversations to build rapport? It's you got two of these, but oftentimes we use the 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 one piece that we have more than the two piece, right? So we can have, it's twice as powerful to listen. And we, we listen through curious, by keep staying curious, right? And being empathetic and by listening and paying attention to those things that our customers are telling us that are the, their pain points, what's important to them, their priorities. And saying things like, um, you know, and being quiet. And one thing that, that Phil likes to say is that the same word listen, if you move the letters around, it actually spells silent. And one of my my words that I learned when I was facilitating in the world of, of selling and even facilitating is the word wait. You know, when you're done asking a question, when you're done presenting something, typically when we see when we hear that awkward silence, we tend to feel this urge to have to fill that with more stuff, right? Because maybe it'll help us help. Uh, you know, be more effective or convince them even more. But what we can do is actually work against us because you're not allowing that silence for the person to digest what they just learned or how to make that decision or what questions they could have. And so waiting is helpful. And the word wait, as I learned it, stands for why am I talking? And I know Vanessa loves that because she says she has a post-it note in her uh, in her monitor to remind herself that sometimes we just have to wait, especially after we ask the question or after we just presented that solution. That's a great way to build rapport. Using their name is another way. I think that's the word that everybody loves to listen to the most. 
We uh, interesting reference. Um, it's not political, but I I just remembered it. it was hilarious to me. It was hilarious is that when Trump was in presidency, I heard I think I read it in a book that in order to keep his attention in the reports when they were going over a whole bunch of really really important reports, they needed to say his name at least every twenty seconds so he could pay attention to the meeting. <laughs> what I just thought that was hilarious. But the truth is, is that listening to your name does keep you attentive. Um, and so I, I know it may not be a good reference with what we have going on this year, but but I mean, come on, use their name. Using their name helps them know that, you know, you're present, that you, you are listening, you're curious, and you are genuinely invested in them. Other words you can use by showing that you're listening. Uh-huh. Wow. Nice. Hmm. Right. And so these are just some other ways to acknowledge that you are present, that you are listening. And then again, you're just acknowledging what it is that they they are want to share with you. So keep a, a few takeaways. I know that I saw it in the chat earlier is that smiling is huge. Show genuine interest. Use their name. And if and one of my favorite other quotes that Phil shares in this audiobook is that if you want to be interesting, you have to be. Who wants to finish that phrase? We're playing the game in the chat here. I get to see it. If you want to be interesting, you have to be interested. Thank you, Lori. You win the prize. Hector, share Juan, Juan's contact with Lori, please. She gets a wheel. <laughs> she gets a wheel. She gets a wheel. All right. So you have to be interested if you want to be interesting. Now, how do we create a genuine opportunity? Is we sometimes do tend, we think that effective persuasion is asking one question and all of a sudden we think we know the solution already to it, right? And that's where this quote becomes really relevant. That prescription before diagnosis is malpractice, right? We haven't earned the right to make that recommendation. If we haven't collected those evidence points, if we haven't collected the facts and, and, and really, really solidifying what it is that they're trying to, to accomplish. And so, uh, one of the four cornerstones of conversational excellence from the exactly what to say methodology is that the person asking the questions controls the conversation. And so going back to using curiosity and empathy, and could you frame up curious questions, empathetic questions? Are we seriously sending information to uh <laughs> I'm watching that, like I hear you, Carlos. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Like, there's, there's like like there's, Juan's information is really going to Lori. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I, our sliding door guy is really becoming a hit in this uh, in this uh, <laughs> reframe. Our, Hector, are we inviting him in October? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he's coming for sure. Carlos, question on the on on the whole concept of why you're still talking. Don't feel this. Don't feel the silence. But then the whole other concept you're saying that the person asking questions controls the conversation. Do you have a how do you bridge that gap? You know, like where you you're telling us. You have to be asking the questions to lead the conversation, but you're also telling us if there's an empty silence, you know, you got to shut up. Don't ask a question. So is, is there something in between or is there or sure. do you fill I, the silence with another question? Yeah. And I'm sure Kevin can chime in on this too. I, this is an art, right? There's a, we're sharing a little bit of the science. The art is in the practice. It, it, a lot of it is feeling the moment, but what I would say is, have you ever found yourself, and Hector, I've caught myself doing this. I've caught you doing it. Because I know that it's sometimes our brain is, is faster and we can't catch up with our thoughts. So the first thing that comes out of our brain is like a question that we ask. But then we thought about a better question to ask after the first question. So we layer it with a different phrased question. But then we thought about a third question to ask. So have you ever found yourself asking three questions and it's all the same thing, but you just you just rephrased it as you said it? That's a perfect example where you could you can ask a question, but if you if you're overly asking the question, you could actually confuse the audience. Or, or you can lead. I think that's that's the other challenge. Is like for example in in law, and I don't know anything about law, but I've seen a lot of TV shows and movies where if, if the attorney asks a question that basically drives the person to a very specific answer, they say objection leading, right? Um, because uh, the question itself is not suppo is supposed to be open-ended, not supposed to, to, to corner the person into, uh, into admitting to something by answering 
the, the question because they have to answer it. And I, what I feel happens a lot is when we layer those questions is because we ask the question at the moment, you're like, you know what, why did I ask it? I know the answer to this. And then we change it a little bit so we can get the second part of the answer. And then we realize that we answer our own question by, by doubling it. And then we go to the third question. And by that point, the person's like, why are you asking if you already know the answer? Right? So, so yes, I think that's a huge issue that we have. And, and I, I think that the smarter we are from the perspective of like how, how quickly we can think on our feet and how quickly we discern as we go and how quickly we read between the lines, the more propensed we are to layer these questions because we are figuring it out as we ask the questions. And the problem is, and then we lose, we lose the person, right? we lose their attention because mm -hmm. they're like, I, I don't know what you just asked me. Mm -hmm. Here's an example. Hey, Kevin. Tell me about your business. What, when did you get started and how did you get into it? Yeah, like, I started. What, but I asked them three questions. Like, could you just give me, yeah. it, isn't it, didn't it lose you a little bit? It's like, where do I go? Which, which of these do you want me to answer? And so that's an example of question layering. You could just say, I'm curious, tell me about your business. And then I'll let you do the brain dump. I have a, I have an interesting approach to this, you know, coming back from a comedy standpoint, I, I look at, conversations kind of similar to like in, in some of the the stuff that I've, I've done is like kind of like when you I, I don't know how many karaoke fans we have out there I mean but you could be like I mean one of my favorite artists to sing for karaoke is like meatloaf right or like Brian Adams like the kick over the stool like intense you know uh <laughs> singing you know it always is like borderline funny because the songs are like way longer than you think they should be but I remember, you know, one of the things in karaoke is that you'll start, you know, in the middle of a song, it'll say 16 bar instrumental break, right? It doesn't mean the song's over. It doesn't mean that you're not engaged with the audience. It doesn't mean that you're still not there with the energy. It's just you're allowing the music and, the, and that kind of borderline silence to kind of continue to play out. And so the idea of people asking the questions controls the conversations. It doesn't mean that the questions have to fill every single gap in the conversation. It just means that's how you regain control, right? If you ask a rhetorical question or you make a statement and then there's silence, as you come to that place, that right at that breaking point of like that Steve Martin humor of knowing when to come right back in with something is start with a question, right? Don't say something again. Don't rephrase something. Say like, well, you know, what, you know, what does that make you feel like? Or how, when was the last time someone asked you that kind of question? Or when was the last time somebody said something like that to you? Yeah, that's brilliant. I love the 16 uh, the bar instrumental breakdown. We, we all need a 16 bar instrumental breakdown from time to yeah, time. Exactly. I think so. But one, something, something that we want to know about is in the moment of, of creating genuine opportunities is, is the five, it, it is a five-step dance. And again, Phil goes over this fairly briefly, but we want to remember that questions is what allows us to create conversations. Conversations is what allow us to build relatability and build relationships. Through that relationship building is what allows us to uncover opportunities. And in the uncovered opportunities, only then could we earn the right to ask the client to take action of doing business with us. And so how do we prevent objections before they come up? And it's being strategic in the way we ask curious and empathetic questions. And one of the things that I love that Phil says here is that success has nothing to do with embellishing. Yes, success in selling has everything to do with destroying the option of no. And asking great strategically curious questions helps us minimize the probabilities of that. Okay. So... Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, for the for the interest of time, we're, I know we've got a whole lot more that we'll share with you and, and we will definitely do that. But I'm going to go ahead and see you know, a place where they can get all the content. Right. I mean, it's going to nice, nice time in October to visit Fort Lauderdale, get all this information. Right. L leave them wanting more. And so right. um, so let we're going to go ahead and skip towards uh, a couple a couple of things here is um, Hector, do you want to? Do you want to move into this slide real quick, and I'll I'll go. Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, I think we still got a few minutes. I would go back maybe three slides to schedule next next action, just so we can go through some examples of how we can use this sort of linguistic hacks to simply ask for what we want. So maybe go. You and Kevin know this very well. I think you should go through at least these three. Sure. Yeah. So one of the exactly what to say phrases is when would be a good time, and what what this does is. It, creates an assumptive frame. And an assumptive frame is basically you are framing a question in such a way, kind of like what Hector was saying is that we're leading the conversation. 
towards a specific outcome. And by putting in that framework, what we're subconsciously telling the listener is that there isn't a bad time. So what we're asking is for a response that in that motivates or inspires or persuades the listener to actually think of when when the next action will be. And it provides confidence too in wanting to continue the conversation with you. But Kevin, what would you add to, to this portion? You know, I think this is this is one of those uh you know, like at this point, you know, going back to we're going to I'm going to use football as an example. So you've been running the ball, right? You're getting three or four yards at a time, but you need a big play, right? You need a 10 yard pass, 15 yard pass, 20 yard pass, whatever it is. This is that scheduling a next action. When you start getting into referrals, this is where you kind of switch, like flip the script a little bit and really try to look forward for forward moments. And by assuming, hey, listen, everything we've talked about to this point is lining up with you, with me. When is a good time? To, for us to talk about this and and getting as specific as when they say well you know I, I could probably talk to you next week it's like okay is the beginning of the week better or the end of the week better well the beginning okay monday or tuesday well monday monday morning or monday afternoon and like getting as like you're at that point you're moving as quickly as possible into that next action um you know it's a it's a little bit of a different cadence yeah and typically it's a good uh part to when you were getting an objection of, hey, let me think about it. Or when you get an objection of, uh, send me the proposal. You know, or when you're getting that that type of uh, response from a client where the full decision hasn't been made yet, but you're kind of three quarters of the way, or you're almost close to that finish line as, as Kevin shared it. These are, these are good moments to insert the, hey, so when would be a good time for us to revisit this conversation? And then lastly, uh, we'll talk a little bit about referrals, you know, why people don't ask for referrals, which is another, you know, element of, uh, of being able to persuade and get paid. And one best way for you to get more customers is asking for referrals. And most people don't ask for referrals because in some cases, they don't want to feel like they're bothering their existing customers. Another is they don't know when to ask for a referral. And the most, the, the hardest one is they don't know how to ask for a referral. And so there is a, a segment that we'll go over, but we won't, We for the interest of time, we'll go over today, but there is a, a strategic way that you can ask for a referral where almost always it will result in a very warm introduction towards uh, a potential customer. And this is one way you to persuade to get more business for customers like the ones that you took care of. So Hector, did you want to wrap it up here? Yeah, yeah. So I was... Uh... As, as I've been studying the concept of being influential and persuasion and salesmanship and and uh, and all everything I learned about this as a practitioner myself as a business owner, um, I, I kind of find that persuasion feels more active and it feels a bit more pushy and influential feels more passive and more sort of leading by example. Hopefully they'll follow, and I think the 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 perfect. Um, Merge between the two, it's a made up word that doesn't exist that I actually sat down with ChatGPT and workshop this thing. And it's the word persuential. Okay. So uh, it's a communication approach that seamlessly combines the persuasive intent with the subtle uh, positiveness of being influential, but all executed within a strong ethical foundation. It should embody guiding your clients towards making the informed decision through compelling yet uh, respectful dialogue ensuring actions are always aligned with the best interest so that's this is the made up word that we just made up for today called being persuasive and it. that's kind of what uh what, what the theme of what these uh, webinar series is all about and carlos let's talk about the conference and uh and we can wrap it up uh, yeah so yeah hit refresh on the screen uh because uh, there's only one active coupon code at the moment, but you can say it out loud as well for the podcast. Yeah, sure. So, you know, obviously, if you want to learn more about uh, how we could, uh, you could be part of this, uh, this journey of uh, a reframe. Uh, we have a conference happening in uh, October 24th through 26th. Let me go ahead and share my screen again one second. Um, but I think, Hector, you're, you're taking control it. again. I'm sharing it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no. So, yeah, I'll just complete your thought here. So the, the conference is in October. Uh, it's going to be uh, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, last weeks of October. 
Uh, we will have a sort of networking event on Wednesday night. So you want to do want to come in on Wednesday night so you can meet everybody and we can you know get to know each other. And then we'll get the work uh, started on Thursday, Friday and half of the day Saturday. We'll talk about having more influential conversations with our clients, with our employees, with our colleagues, with our partners, with our software companies that we deal with. The ticket price is eighteen hundred dollars. I'll be speaking there. Carlos will be speaking there. Kevin will be speaking there. Uh, and there is an active coupon code 0331. Just use code 0331, which expires March 31st to get a $200 uh, off of the ticket price. So it comes down to $1,600. We've had, uh, no, we're probably about half something. with our ticket sales. Yeah. I just want to throw in something really quick. All the conferences that I do, going behind the scenes with you guys and talking about what the, what's going to happen at this event. This is the most intentional and thoughtful uh setup for for getting people to learn about stuff at this at this conference we're talking about how the the keynotes lead to the breakouts the the conversations in the halls and the corridors all of this is going to be really guided and it's so wonderful to be a part of this i'm excited to be a part of it but i'll tell you what carlos and hector are doing behind the scenes to really make this an intentional conference so that you come away with every takeaway humanly possible uh, and then some, uh, you know, I'm I'm super excited to be a part of it. What you guys are creating is really going to be a an industry disruptor, but also something that is going to move people into a, you know, really actionable um, position when they when they come. Thank you so Kevin, much. Thank you. So reframe2024.com. I forgot to say that. Sorry, Carlos. Reframe2024.com. www.reframe2024.com. Thank you very much. Wrap it up, Carlos. Yeah, just to close it, one of the first. Huge thank you for all who joined today. Huge thank you, Kevin Boyle, for joining us and sharing your incredible experience, knowledge, and insights. Um, you know, we we are just very grateful and excited for those who are already coming. And for those who aren't coming, it should be a no-brainer. And a uh, shout out to those who joined that are all other, exactly what to say, coaches who will be joining us in the conference. Shout out to those who are coming to the conference and the table facilitators that will be helping us through this experience. And, and we're super excited. And so thank you all for joining today. And uh, with that, until next time. Thanks, guys.